Okay, I'm going to now call this meeting of the Sweetwater City Council to order. I'm going to ask Councilman Lee to give the invocation this morning and Councilman Cherry to lead us in the pledge. <coughs> Father, we pause to refresh ourselves at your throne. Know that your grace is sufficient for all times. We thank you for this season. Thank you that you came as a child and you left as a risen Savior. Thank you for loving us, keeping us, giving us peace and hope. Pray that you'd use this time to bless us as well as give us wisdom and encouragement to make the right decisions. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So let me pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, we'll go to item four, which is for public input. Is there anyone wishes to speak? Okay, we'll move to item five. We'll now hear, uh, which is to hear a presentation from Mr. Danny, Dana Shoning, AICP, Director of Planning and Development Services regarding current residential and commercial refuge collection services. Good morning, Dana. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Council. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the opportunity to come before you and uh, talk about, a, I think, a very important issue in our community, uh, and it's uh, refuse collection. So my presentation is going to be on our current refuse collection service and to take a look at some alternatives that uh, Council may consider down the line and how to manage or how to guess the conditions <coughs> of refuse collection in our community. Um, okay, so the purpose of this is really to, and I have it listed out, review our solid waste management program. I'll be providing some information, some pictures, kind of my observations of uh, what we currently have as a program. Uh, discuss a bit. Um, the state legislature and state law does allow for uh, city councils uh, to uh, contract with private service providers uh, under what we would call an exemption. Uh, if there's a public health and safety need to uh, quickly go out and uh, contract out with a service provider for refuse collection. And that is allowed, uh, local government code section 252.002. And it does, again, you're here because we'll make a decision for potential action at the end of this meeting based on that statute that you can do that. Uh, we're gonna examine uh, what I would see as a potential need to potentially privatize uh, the refuse collection service. That's another alternative. Municipal solid waste management done by the public body or it could be privatized. And that is a trend out uh, nationally currently for this type of service. Financial considerations of the alternatives uh, for collection services, um, if in fact we ever privatize, say the decision is to move there, we have to reflect that in our city code uh, to accommodate that type of a program. So there will be some city code amendments also that I'll touch on a little bit as we move along. And then any steps that would have to be put in place to uh, privatize the service if that's the, the direction that was provided. So it really comes down to looking at some direction from the city council on where we want to move in this uh, refuse collection program. 
We have a number of components here um, that are part of our current system. And I have them listed out there. Obviously, we do refuse collection for residential customers. We do uh, <coughs> contract out, provide refuse collection for commercial customers. We have a recycling drop-off center, our DOC, which provides um, citizens to come in and drop off what I would call special waste those wastes that we would not accept in our landfill. And so it's a nice service for those folks to say, I'll just take it over here and, and you can get rid of it at that location and then we'll take it someplace or we'll ask for some, you know, we'll get some revenue off of the recyclable. We have two landfills. Uh, we have the West Landfill, which is uh, still open. Uh, we have about maybe four more months uh, to keep it open, but we are um, required to maintain that landfill for five years for TCD2 regulations to make sure that it closes properly and that we can have the sign off on that. So we're committed for at least five years on our west landfill and of course our east landfill opened up October 1st. Um, so we're using that landfill moving ahead with uh, the citizens uh, ability to bring waste out to that landfill. <coughs> From a program support, we have staffing. I'm getting to a little bit of the numbers. We certainly have vehicles and equipment. And then um, I'm going to give you kind of my take on the current state of the refuse collection system. Our, we'll say that our solid waste management program currently um, under a residential program has five refuse collection operators, CDL certified refuse collection operators. We have two on our commercial routes. We have a superintendent, a foreman, and we have an equipment operator primarily at the landfill, uh, moving dirt, covering the waste that comes in and taking care of that. We have uh, nine part-time attendants. That is really what we have for staffing for everything that we do, from the recycling center, to the refuse collection, to the landfills. That's, that's it right there for current staffing. A big component uh, is our trucks, obviously. Uh, and this is a, a pretty telling slide, quite honestly. We have four residential garbage uh, side load trucks that we have in our inventory. We have three commercial uh, front load or garbage front load trucks. And uh, looking at that, it's, an, it's a, uh, an inventory or a fleet that is fairly old. Uh, we have, we're pushing 10 years on all but one uh, of those collection trucks. And, and I appreciate the information I got uh, regarding maintenance. Over really the last five years for our residential garbage side loaders, uh, we're at about 281,053 for maintenance uh, over that five year period. From a commercial truck standpoint, we're at about 180,290, a total of 461,352. That is what we are currently putting in or have put in for maintenance of those vehicles. And it's, I would think that it's continuing to go up. I mean, they're older vehicles uh, and we have to keep maintaining them. This is probably a cost that we would have to maintain if we kept the program ourselves. There will be truck replacement needs. And so this is really a five year outlook. I would say it's probably more like a two to three, but because we really need to have the trucks um, for instance, uh, and these are estimated numbers, by no means are these the exact numbers. This is just kind of a, okay, what's the going rate on some of these vehicles? So three residential side load, it's about $260,000 a piece. So if we replace three of the four, we're looking at about $780,000. Um, two commercial front loads, uh, we're looking at about $290,000 piece, 580,000 total, so that's about $1.3 million in replacing our fleet. Oh, again, not in the first year, 
likely to be over really a five year period, but that is a cost that we would have to incur if in fact we maintain the system or continue the system under our operation. And uh, this is an important slide because this is the bigger ticket item for that, for that program. We have other equipment to work with our landfills and uh, that type of thing, but this is really for refuse and collection from residential and commercial. This is our recycling center. Um, our recycling center is a certified uh, center for, uh, from the PCEQ. It will accept those special wastes like metal, glass, cardboard, paper, tires, used motor vehicle, um, oil filters, brush, and yard waste. And it's really at no cost. Uh, I say at no cost. The public can bring it there and they won't get charged a fee on the site. But this is a, a, a pretty neat, uh, unique operation that we have here that provides a good service, in my opinion, to the public. And so you'll see that this may be something we need to continue, some uh, element. This is really our, our landfills, and I touched on that. Um, the East Landfill opened October 1st. It's got a life cycle of 120 years. So uh, we can, uh, citizens can use that landfill for quite a while to bring anything that they want to out there. They're already paying a fee on their utility bill to do so, and that's $2 uh, per billing to use that landfill really at, I would call, no cost. They don't get charged at the site. They just bring it in, we, we figure how much they have, and we, we total that, calculate that, and we send a report off to TCEQ to reflect what we're receiving. And the West Landfill, as I mentioned, um, had been in operation for a long time. Uh, it is, uh, we're under the five-year closure maintenance requirement currently. So those are, we have commitments for those <coughs> landfills moving forward. Now I'm gonna get into some pictures here. Um, and I do wanna state that what you're gonna see here is my observations, maybe your observations, maybe your observations out in the community. Uh, it no way reflects anything on uh, staff or uh, anything at all. This is just really the state of where we're currently at as it would relate to limited funding, limited ability, in my opinion, to uh, bring in the necessary resources, people, uh, to manage this program. And so this is kind of what I see out there, and I'm going to share it with you today, and I think it's important. So these are um, really refuse containers, they're really residential containers. Uh, I think what's important is <coughs> that they're located <coughs> in the street right of way. You can see that uh, where else are we going to put them? So in some places we have alleys, that's where they go, but where we don't have alleys, this is where they go. They're in the street right of way. They're hanging on curbs, uh, they could get potentially damaged. Um, there's property maintenance issues around it, you'll see. There's vegetation growing around them. Uh, just uh, another. Here's some other examples. You know, these are some examples of containers. And uh, when I went out and, and took the pictures, this is not in that neighborhood only. This is citywide. I, I went citywide. This is what I'm seeing. And so the containers are not in very good shape. The lids are, are damaged or they, they don't close. You know, that's kind of what we're dealing with regarding this. So the, the point is, you know, in addition to the container itself and the location, uh, there is some property, in my opinion, some property value issues here with containers sitting in front yards like that, the way that they are. I'm not trying to be negative, I'm just trying to be objective and just reflecting everything through you folks. Here's our some commercial containers. I think, again, they're in the street right away or they're sitting on the curbs and again, so they get placed in places that they probably shouldn't, but in this case, in most of these, there's really no other location. Um, you know, this is in our uh, downtown area and there's not a whole lot of other property. Now, there is an alley, um, if you take a look at the, the right, upper right, there is an alley that that could probably be placed in, but for convenience purposes, this is where they're going. Uh, the one on the lower left is interesting, that's right in the street taking up the parking spot. And I don't quite honestly think that's an adequate location for a, a container because it, it, it creates a safety issue and we have some of that going on out there. 
And then we have uh, this situation with uh, debris and unsightly, uh, as I have seen, and I think a lot of people have seen, and I know we work to clean up these areas, but these become dumping grounds. We have our debris and bulk items that are placed to the next to the containers because it's an easy place to put them. And I, I firmly believe that some of our public believes that we actually have, and, I, and this is just me, we don't have a consistent debris pickup program. Uh, we do it when we can, but I think the public sometimes thinks that we're gonna be in there on a monthly basis taking this stuff away, and we only do it when we are able to do it, when we have staff that's able to do it and time. So that's not happening. But what you see here is mattresses, appliances, brush and limbs, the containers themselves are uh, in bad shape, but again, uh, vegetation growth around the containers. Uh, to me, this points significantly to health and safety concerns in this community. Uh, on two occasions, I went out there just to take pictures and I was scared off by a cat that jumped out of the container. I mean, when I'm, there's just a lot of stuff going on out there that probably shouldn't be, and I think that this is something that we need to address. So. When I'm talking public health and safety, I'm looking directly at some of these pictures or they're in my mind. Uh, here's some other ones just to give you a sense. Again, a lot of mattresses. Uh, the container on the upper left is really a replacement container, uh, but we have garbage uh, underneath it that spewed out from the old container and still is there. So there's some operational issues, uh, how we manage in some cases. I think the staff, recently has done a great job of replacing a lot of rotted containers out there. We ordered some new ones. We were able to get some of the other ones rehabilitated. So um, this is less of an issue right now than it probably was about a month ago or two. Just some other examples of um, some uh, debris that's left off at the uh, container locations. Most of these, I think, are, are in the alleys, but they're not all in the alleys, folks. They're in the street, too. Uh, where we have containers in the street, this is happening, too. I probably just don't have any pictures of that to reflect that. I should, I probably should have. There's just some other examples, and uh, again, you can see the state of the containers and the debris that's accumulated. This is, I think, the biggest issue that we have. Moving ahead, um, so let's think about privatized service because that's the other alternative. If you look at the two options, one is there's got to be an investment one way or another. Whether we continue to manage it, we have to invest. We've got trucks that we have to purchase. We've got containers that we have to purchase. We have to do all that. Uh, on the other hand, we could privatize the service and that could be, and that's going to be a cost too. And I'll, I'll show you why. We have our recycling program that I just went through. We maintain that drop-off center for receiving those materials. This is how I see it potentially moving ahead if we privatize. We need to maintain our recycling center. But one component of that is to remove the blue bins at the business locations and not pick those up. Primarily that's for cardboard. So we have to have a CDL driver go out and pick that up and it's a cost to us, although we receive some revenue from the recyclable material, it's a significant cost. And I see that that is something that needs to be considered as we move from the, pro from the operation and we would still maintain our recycling center. That's my thought. The type four certified landfills we are under obligation to maintain those by PCT rules. Then another component to this, and this is a little bit different, is to utilize the staff that we would have in uh, doing some, I would call emergency cleanups of alleyways <coughs> to provide that at a higher level. And it's more than as needed, it's just to get out there and do it because if we go privatize service, I don't know whether the alleys are going to get cleaned up anytime soon. We'll have to clean them up and educate the public about no dumping in the alleys because I think 
it's just been done that way for so long that the, cha the, the mindset is we're going to put it out there. But we have to change that. What that means is I think we're going to have to have some staff to go out there and clean up these areas um, in the transition period between uh, if the program begins privatized to um, get those alleys completely cleaned up. Uh, we're going to have to offer more services, I think, in that area. Just down the, the list that I have here, uh, again, this is more of a summary to what you see in the pictures, kind of my observations, my thoughts on the program. I think we have a problem with the location of multi customer dumpster locations in this big right of way. I think it's efficient, but um, they become dumping grounds for debris and bulk items, in my opinion. Uh, I, I know we. We don't have a, an, an organized debris and bulk pickup program currently. And with a privatized service, that would be part of the service. It would be a recurrent bulk and debris pickup as part of the service. Our refuse containers, there's uh, some problems on the maintenance. You can see that from the pictures. And, and again, that's, that's resources. You know, I, I know that we've been struggling, and Russell would attest to this, you know, just to bring in a welder. That's difficult because of the competition for employment. And so if we don't have a welder, we don't have the ability to rehabilitate our container. That's not, not on anybody. It's just hard to recruit uh, in, in the community. And then funding is always an issue uh, as it would relate to the trucks. So uh, property maintenance around the refuse containers is problematic. Um, the trucks, the maintenance, it's not just the maintenance, it's the downtime, okay? So with maintenance comes downtime. When we're scrambling to get a truck out there, uh, the service becomes unreliable and undependable. So if I have a container and it didn't get emptied, why did it get emptied? Well, we, we may not have had a driver that day. Certainly the truck was in the shop, so we're struggling with that. And I can tell you right now, and I'm not promoting it, advocating necessarily, but that would not happen in a privatized service because there will always be trucks and always be drivers. So um, I think also uh, the direction probably, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying now, but in previous years regarding ordering equipment and materials to stay ahead of uh, the maintenance of those containers, uh, I'm not sure whether that has been done adequately. <coughs> We tend to get a lot of calls. We're in reactive mode, not necessarily proactive mode in the department. And then um, staff is too often placed in that reactive mode, as I just said. It's due to a lack of resources, and it's a, a little bit of a disjointed program. And I'm just being honest in my assessment. I think it needs to tighten up a bit to, to make sure that we provide the best service that we can to the public. And I don't think we are. That's just my, my thought. Right now, I don't think we are. So that's why we're having this workshop today. <coughs> so future programming needs. So if I, I look at how we might move ahead, uh, this is where we would generate some revenue still, a landfill fee at $2 per customer per filling. We have landfill disposal fees. That's where we contract or set containers out for anybody, roofers, for instance. I mean, they can bring those materials to our landfill. We generate some off of that. I have franchise fees, and I'll get into that. Or Joe, may, if he gets out, talk about franchise fees a little bit more. But uh, franchise fees is something that we have the ability to um, get through, um, if we go privatized, we can set a percentage on top of the base rate that is a franchise fee, and we receive that. And it can be set at anything, pretty much. Uh, and then we have <coughs> recyclables that we generate revenue. So I look at the, again, thumbnail, this point in time, about $340,000 that we would receive from revenue, <coughs> the way the program is currently structured. From an expenditure standpoint, what I did is I took personal services, I scaled it down to not include refuse collection or commercial refuse collection. 
we have our supplies, our contractual services, and that. It's really keeping our recycling center, our two landfills, doing some cleanups in our alleys. We're looking at about $641, $642,000 would be the cost to continue that, which is less than what the total cost of the department is if we had all of it, including refuse collection. But there's a, a net loss here, estimated net loss of $377,000. That's what I see right now. And then, and I don't have it on the slide. I think I have it on the slide. Um, well, there are some other costs here that I don't have reflected on here. So let's think about this generally. The service center provides services for everybody and for us. They get paid out through what we generate for revenue. And they budgeted that for this year. That would be a, then they'd have to rebudget or really take a look at their budget because that wouldn't be generated. It's a, it's a cost to doing business that we would pay out through the general fund to Russell and the service center. Same as down at our billing office. There's a cost there that is reflected, has to come out of the general fund to support the program also. Um, and in total, that's probably about, I want to say about $350,000 currently if you add the two up. That's just where they'd have to modify the budgets, and, but would affect what they do and how they plan for their budgets and their annual programming. So there's a cost. Right there. I, uh, I throw this slide out there because I, I think it's important to um, get us uh, from the standpoint of if it went privatized service. This is an, a sheet for example residential rates. Now I break it down into three areas. We have our in-city customers, our out-of-city customers, and we have our multi or multi-family customers. What I try to do here is just give you a sense of what the additional cost may be. And I, I have taken uh, an example rate I actually received from Joe, uh, and it's pretty reflective of what you have for information. And what I see here is some increases. The, the thing to consider here is most of our customers, about 3,400 of them have the three yard side load container they use. 24 have a 96 gallon cart currently. If you're an out of city customer, um, only five are using the three yard side load container for the refuse, but 129 are using a 96 gallon cart. Under a privatized service, everybody would be using a 96 gallon cart. And that's it, it wouldn't, we would, remove the three yard container from the alleys and from the streets and everybody gets their own cart. So if you look at this rate, if you're a regular city customer based on a 10% franchise fee, which is above the uh, rate, base rate, uh, you're looking at probably a $3 increase. And I would say that the key is, you see that there's a brush and bulk debris rate which we currently don't charge, but we have a rate of 2485. The rates that are provided includes that itemized brush and debris removal rate. In total, if you're an in-city customer, your bill would go up probably about $3. <coughs> that includes a monthly pickup for debris and bulk. If you are currently at a 96 gallon container, your rate will go up, would go up almost $9. Because you, you get a, a new 96 gallon container to replace the one that you currently have. But our rates that we charge at the city are less for the 96 gallon container. If we privatize, it'll all be just uh, just one container, same rate. So those folks would be more impacted on price. The 24 in city, 
and not getting into the numbers necessarily, um, the, the folks that have the three yard side loads that are out of city limits are looking at about a $6 increase. And if you currently have a 96 gallon cart, you're looking at, it could be $11 increase on a monthly bill for those 139 folks that currently have a 96 gallon cart. From a multifamily standpoint, it's based on containers. Uh, it's an increase of about just over three, oh, just under three dollars per container, based on my understanding of the rate. So I guess the point is there's gonna be increases. A lot of the increases we see are to provide for a debris in bulk pickup on a monthly basis. That's really where I see the increases for this. And this is a rate that was provided uh, and I just used it for just the one year. Commercial. Jeff, you wanna run that slide over? Thank you. All I did for commercial is I looked at what our current rate was got a two yard, three yard, four yard, six yard, and eight yard container. What our current rate is, what the, what the customer's charged, it's charged per cubic yard. So on a two yard, it's 2270 times two, 45, 40. If we want privatized, and these are certainly not the rates, this is just my example, not any rates that, I mean, no negotiated rate, this is our rate. So I just wanted you to see that with a 10% franchise fee, uh, that rate would go up $4.55. Now, whatever the base rate is, that's, that's to be negotiated out as it goes to 12, but at least that amount probably will be the increase to a, a commercial customer based on the cubic yard uh, container that they have. So it's an increase. One more, Zach. Utility bill uh, example, all I did here is reflect that when you, right now, our, our bill just shows refuse pickup at the 2485. Again, that's our rate, no new rates. If we just went with the franchise fee rate, it's then 2734, the increase of just under $3. Now, that's just on the refuse pickup in the total billing where you have water, sewer, refuse, and landfill fee. Um, you're looking uh, currently $78.37 to $81.09. So that's you know, under $3 increase there in the utility bill. Uh, but whatever the rates might be for residential refuse collection will change these numbers. Again, if you decide to go that route, that those are negotiated rates, and so this will change. I think this is pretty close still within, you know, give or take, but that's kind of where we're at. I wanted you to see that, and the point <coughs> the rates will go up. I mean, generally speaking, on a residential standpoint, we have to reinvest into our system to make sure we're doing it well. If it goes uh, privatized, there's gonna be an increase can be an increase either way, quite honestly, but um, with the rates, they'll have to increase mainly because of uh, the franchise fees that we have the ability to, to garner. Um, and so, this just gives you an idea. There are some, what I call, non-economic considerations. Uh, what I've really tried to touch on is the health and safety. I really, again, um, we're not the only community that is dealing with this, but there are some health and safety issues down the line. I think risk protection is something that we currently have to manage, but we wouldn't if it was turned over. So there's that risk protection. I think also um, in looking at the vehicles and other things, the innovation, technology, and expertise, if it's a company that this is what they do and this is all they do, that's gonna be probably something that they're gonna do a whole lot better and provide that, that improvement in those areas. Just from an efficiency standpoint, I, I kinda look at efficiency as 
getting out there, not having to scramble for, you know, trucks and drivers. You're dependable, reliable, as I state here, a consistent program. Not to say we can't do it, but we need the resources in order to get that done. And then, uh, generally speaking, community beautification. Uh, I think uh, if we went that route, it would, and again, I'm talking about really the three yard containers going away and then we keep the 96 gallon as it is community makeover, in my opinion, in that area. Next steps, if in fact, the direction is for privatized services to negotiate franchise agreement terms. <coughs> That's the rates, other terms, uh, really is trying to establish a contract between the city and a private service provider. Uh, we would have to amend our city code of ordinances. Uh, as an example, we would have to put something in there that if we went to the 96 gallon carts, people can only put them out at a certain time and they have to move them back to the house. They can't move them on the street. And so that is a code we don't have in our, in our ordinance. We'd have to put something in there. Plus the, the whole agreement or the franchise agreement would have to be codified in our city code of ordinances also. Um, we would come back to the city council with a um, recommendation and it would be considered for a negotiated agreement. That would then set the customer billing rate adjustments we would have a very big and significant public education program because this is a big change, could be a big change in this community. Uh, I talked about you know, no dumping in the alleys and we would have to certainly uh, educate the public out there and enforce our codes. I mean, it could be a, a big change for the community. I believe it would be. So we have to get out there and let them know what's going on and how things have changed and how they can't do certain things that they have done before. Uh, and then uh, the commercial program privatized is something that really is between, we have to know the rates and we have to codify what those are, but it's based on uh, the provider and the commercial business. Whereas we do the billing for residential collection and privatized collection, commercial is different. The billing comes right from the private service provider and we don't do the billing at this level anymore. Easier slide. So I tried to slow it down a little bit to give some information. I know you have uh, a lot of stuff in front of you. I think my thought is you kind of know where the situation that we're dealing with. Um, and so, if there's any questions that you have of me, and I know Joe Spano from Revenue Public Services is here and, and would like to give a presentation to the City Council, and maybe questions could wait until after that, or I could answer some questions or try and answer some at this point, and then Joe can give his presentation afterwards. However, whatever your pleasure is. I have a question regarding those seven to nine people who operate our trucks now, <coughs> what's gonna happen to them? Well, um, great question. They are CDL's drivers. They've got the certification. If it went privatized, I wouldn't put the, the, cer the I wouldn't put like Republic Services on the hook here, but I would think they would seriously look at our drivers uh, to see if there might be a spot open for them. Also, there's other city positions that uh, if they become available that they could apply for, and I think we do everything that we possibly can to keep them here, is my opinion. But I do know that they're because they're certified, they're in demand, quite honestly, for their certifications. I think that that's a, a good commodity, I think, for anybody that um, looking, you know, that would have to look elsewhere for a, for a job. So. And there are four that are, are eligible for retirement based on either their age or years of service. So there would only be three that aren't vested. If by chance there was one that wasn't hired, 
by either Republic or somewhere else, and they were terminated, would there be some sort of a, a agreement with them to provide something until they could find a job? I, I, I just hate to turn somebody out on the street. Uh, One of the, that was the main concern we had was, was the, uh, the employees. We always <coughs> think of the employees first when, when making decisions there. I know there are open positions in other departments that if, if we could train them up to do those jobs and they were willing to do those jobs, that we would uh, seriously consider them for those positions. I think there's a couple in the water department and, and we, have, we have vacancies, so we would okay. offer those vacancies first and foremost to anybody who was affected if we went private. Uh, of course, like uh, Dana mentioned, Republic would be would be looking for drivers, and uh, would they'd have first crack if the employees wanted to uh, work for Republic, have first crack at, at those types of uh, vacancies or, or availabilities for jobs within within the company or whichever company that we choose to go with. Um, if if nothing like that worked out, then we could we could take a look at something like you're describing maybe a, a severance type program of some sort or something like that, I think is what you're, what you're yeah, describing. Right. Uh, we, would, we would take a, take a, a good hard look at, at something like that. We wanna give them a, a parachute to, I mean, if they're gonna uh, have to do another job because of the moves we might be making today or next month or the following month, we wanna give them as, as good of a landing as, as we can and, and would pull out every available resource that we could think of to try to help them and their families get through the process. Okay. Yes, Good. sir. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Dana, how would privatization affect your workload? I uh, would imagine you spend a fair amount of time on refuse collection now. And, and what what adjustments would you see to your duties? Well, um, that's a good point because when you look at the staffing, of that staffing amount. So my duties, honestly, from a city as a whole, <coughs> what we don't have and what we need to work on is our, our planning. We, we've got a planning and development services department where we're really code enforcement. I mean, we're, we're city services code enforcement and we don't have, in my opinion, a real good planning piece to this. And I think it's something we have to build. And that could include, you know, comprehensive planning, and that would also involve, if we're looking at our corridor area, putting in some zoning overlays, which we, we need to, to do. And so if that program would take off, from my standpoint, I would get more involved in that area and, and less in the solid waste management area. So I would have to change what, what I do, and I have some plans to do that too, um, as it would relate to staffing, Again, we would you know, obviously reduce the staffing levels. We'd have to modify <coughs> a little bit what we do, be a little bit more flexible in providing some cleanups, maybe even some community cleanups on a more recurrent level. But uh, I, I see that, you know, that's the changes that I see. Okay. Certainly, I would, I would find a bet, much better use of your skill set um, if we privatized, let you, let you focus in these other areas. <coughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move to item 5B, which is to hear a presentation from Mr. Joe Spano with the Republic regarding proposed privatization of refuge collection service for the city of Sweetwater. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so, <laughs> if you don't mind, um, where's that little? Dana, where's that pointer? Joe, if, I know, if, uh, Joe, if on the side there's an on-off, if you could switch it off and then back on, that might help with the... Uh, oh, is it that way? Is it on-off? It's on the left side. <coughs> oh, okay. Oh, that might help. Well, I pointed that way. Okay. Yeah, so if you don't mind, I know that uh, Dana and I both prepared um, a couple of presentations for you. We didn't do it together. It's going to seem like it. He hit a lot of the points that I'm going to hit. So for fear of redundancy, if, if you all don't mind, I know everyone loves a good PowerPoint, right? <laughs> so when I see some redundancy, I'm going to go ahead and skip. But I want to start out backwards because 
something was brought up um, a second ago that, uh, <clears throat> and I believe it was from Mr. Lee, that uh, is near and dear to us, right? So you brought up staffing, right? And, um, and I think, and this is for, for everybody in the room, right? Our people are number one, right? And what I mean by people is yours and ours, right? Internal and external. And so I think sometimes there can be fear when, you know, the big juggernaut wants to come to town, there goes all the jobs, right? And, and we understand that there's always going to be that fear. Um, but we don't, we don't hire robots, right? So trucks need drivers and our trucks need good people. And we've got three of our great people with us today, right? We have Kevin, Joel, and Leisha. And, you know, they're here as a testament to, well, hey, let's not lie. We, they drove for us today, right? We, bring, we brought some trucks to show you. But uh, we, whenever I come to speak to a council, I always like to bring some of our folks. Because if they're going to take their time to be here, it's, it's important to them too, right? So our people are very important. And we've had our Abilene leadership is also here, you know, Jay Klein in the, in the brown coat, and Jeff. Jeff heads up our maintenance department in Abilene, keeps all of our fleet running. Jay's in charge of everything that goes on in Abilene. So our people are number one. And so I, I don't want anybody to have any fear that we're trying to come to your town and, and get rid of a bunch of folks, right? Typically, in, in a city of any size, you have departments that always run lean, right? We have departments that run lean. I could assure you if you went to our building department in San Angelo, they would say, oh, we wish we had nine more people. Everybody has departments in every city that run lean. So most of the time, what usually happens is when a, privatize, a privatization does take place, there are always departments that you start looking at saying, well, where can we move some of these folks? And Dana and, um, and David already spoke to it. There's always opportunity within the city to absorb folks, right? Because at the time, you're not thinking about it because it hasn't happened. And so when something triggers it, then you start saying, well, we, we really need a CDL over here. We have this great person who has shown a lot of leadership. He may not be driving anymore, but we think he's going to be a great leader in this department. And so you kind of know where I'm going. But I wanted to lead with that because our people are number one. And I don't ever want anybody to think that, um, as I said, the juggernaut's coming to town and we're trying to kill jobs. That's not what we do. We want to create them. And outside of the city, look, we're always looking for a good driver, right? We, we always need them. Trucks need drivers, right? So fast food is going to robots. That's never going to happen in our industry, right? We always need good folks behind the wheel to service the customer, which is the entire reason why we're here, right? So I just wanted you all to, to know that right, right off the bat because, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lee brought it up, and, and I, I don't ever want anybody to think that that's the purpose of what we do. It's not what our company does, so... <clears throat> um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Republic, um, we are the second largest waste company in the nation. And I'm, I'm, I won't spend a bunch of time telling you how big we are, right? Because nobody wants to hear that. And quite frankly, that's not what we do. We're all local people. But I do need to tell you, right? I have to do my job and tell you who we are. So we, yeah, we are a very large company. We're publicly traded. We operate the sixth largest vocational trucking fleet in the nation. We have over 35,000 employees. And we serve over 3,000 municipal contracts in the United States, 300 of which are in the state of Texas, 45 of which are your neighbors. So we do a lot of business. The Abilene and San Angelo Division, which is what we are, we call them business units. Our business unit is 215, and we operate over 40 cities in this around, you know, a lot of your neighbors, right? So we live here. We work here. I'm an Abilene guy, right? I live in San Angelo, but I'm from Abilene. So... These folks are all living in Abilene. So, you know, we, we're, we're right down the road. We're, we're local folks, right? So uh, we, we definitely have a vested interest in the communities that we serve. So Dana spoke a little bit about when you think about privatizing, it's not only, you know, we handle the job part, but we, we look at the equipment that we use, right? So it is not... What you're hearing today from, from staff is completely normal, right? So containers in cities that do their own trash always fall to the wayside, right? It, it's just a fact. Because that fixed object is not something that is top of mind, right? When you look at spending the money on fixing something, 
it's usually going to be a truck to keep it rolling, right? Or it's going to be something at the landfill when you're talking solid waste. But we all know how many moving parts there are to keeping a city running. And typically, a garbage can sitting on a street corner, as long as that thing is able to get hooked and dumped, then we're good, right? And that's pretty much the way it goes. So having, uh, so having containers that, are have, that don't have lids that are working right or that need a new coat of paint, look, it falls by the wayside. And if you look at your average three yard, you know, if you look at a three yard container, if you guys wanted to go pluck one off the corner and bring it to the shop to get it fixed, you're looking at around $150 when you're all in between the blasting and the painting and doing the lids and maybe some minor welding, right? And that's probably not, if you have to replace the entire bottom, that's probably just the general cosmetic. But if you were to go and buy it, you're looking at, you know, over 300. And if you get into your commercial containers, you're looking at four, five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars depending on the size, and even more than the 300 to fix them. So there's a lot of cost involved. And so if it's working, that's just typically the way it goes, and, and, and we get it. What privatization does is that takes all that away from you, right? So we are going to be the ones that are responsible for the containers. And one of you mentioned a while ago, you said, well, what is that going to do to the customer service as far as, you know, the workload to staff? Well, it, it completely cuts it more than in half, right? Because we answer to you. And the customer, as far as the commercial side, right, the commercial customers are going to be dealing directly with us. So they'll, they won't be calling City Hall saying, hey, our garbage was skipped or we had a windstorm last night and my lid cracked off. They're not calling you, they're calling us, right? So it takes that piece away from staff. Staff is dealing with the residential piece. But the service piece is on us, right? We work for you, we work for the citizen, and so that workload goes away almost overnight, right? <clears throat> the other thing that you look at is the, you know, the unsightly debris and the odors and things like that. That's what good, well-maintained containers are gonna solve that problem. You know, Dana showed you some pictures, and I'll skip over the ones that I have, but. Dana showed you, so all that will go away, right? When a customer realizes that a container is broken, I mean, we send another one out and we get it fixed, and that's just part of it. And all that is in the rate. So there's a lot of the questions that I get, obviously, and, and look, feel free to, to ask me a question whenever. You can interrupt me, it doesn't bother me, or we can wait to the end. But a lot of it is, well, what kind of extra fees are there going to be that we don't know about, right? You have a rate sheet and you're showing us rates and telling us about the service, well, what is that going to cost? So that, there aren't any extra fees of any kind, right? So there's not, there's not a bill at the end of the month saying, hey, we replaced 15 containers here. Th that's not the way it works, right? Everything that we do is based on algorithms, based on how long we think a container is going to last and things like that, and it's all in the rate. So there's not going to be any surprises at the end or anything like that. The, I have up here on the shared containers hassle, right? And I know you said, well, what is a hassle of sharing a container? Um, I have a feeling several of you that live in town probably have one of the shared three yarders or two, whatever they are. So I would imagine, ba just based on history, that there has been a time or two that you have stepped out to empty your trash and somebody has thrown something in there that has taken up the entire container. Mm -hmm. We have seen freezers, we've seen washers and dryers, we've seen old office chairs, you name it. And then you don't have any room to put your you don't have any room to put your stuff in there, right? Even if it's just a bag. And it happens. It happens every place. The polycart virtually eliminates that. The polycart allows what's called ownership, right? We, we, we own what we throw out. So you know you're not going to be able to put a freezer in your polycart. A, it won't fit, and B, you're not going to be able to drag it to the curb. But when you have just a three yard sitting at a curb, that allows the customer, or not even the customer, it allows illegal dumping first and foremost, right? But take away the illegal dumping, that allows any customer, even if it was mine, to say, well, I, I'm, it's mine, I'm gonna throw it in there. But you're not worried about the three or four other families that are sharing that, right? So that creates what's the insightly. And that's where that stuff comes from, that you saw those pictures. Somebody didn't go and just stop and dump that all at once. Those are things that accumulate over time because somebody is going out and putting it there. Nine times out of 10, it's because it's full from somebody else. And so it just becomes a chain reaction, right? And so the polycart eliminates all that. And right now in the country, 82% of the communities are, it's what's called automated, right? Y'all are already using polycarts in some of your community, in, in some of the neighborhoods. But that's the, that is sort of the future. It's really into the future, it's where we are now, right? It started years ago. 
but that is where waste removal is, and it's where it should be, and that's where it's always going to go is automation. Not only is it a safer way to pick up garbage, it's a heck of a lot quicker. It gets us in and out, and most importantly, it gets us out of your alleys where we're busting water lines, and we're breaking gas lines, and we're tearing down people's trees, tearing down people's fences, right? All those happen no matter what company is doing the work, no matter what city is doing the work. There's always going to be damage working in tight alleys. That doesn't mean there's not going to be any alleys that we want service, right? So typically on a poly cart, you're serviced at the edge of your driveway. So wherever your driveway is, is where your service is going to be. So if you happen to be one of those folks that has an alley driveway, typically that's where the cart is going to be serviced. Unless there's an anomaly and there's just no way a truck can get in there. But those are things that the operations guys will figure out when we have the opportunity to start delivering carts to you we will be on the ground to figure out what is the best placement for this neighborhood, right? So there may be a couple of differences. But for the most part, the, uh, the driveway is where a poly cart is going to be uh, serviced. And it beautifies the town, right? So when you, when you look about, when you, when you look around town, any town, and you, you see containers, metal containers, that are mismatched in color. Some have lids, some don't. Some have metal lids, some have plastic lids. Some have paint, some don't have paint. It creates a hodgepodge going down your streets, right? So when you have visitors from out of town, that's the first thing they're going to see, right? That container may be working perfectly fine, but it doesn't look great, right? And so that's where the push originated to go to automation, right? It gets the garbage off of the front of your home, it beautifies the neighborhood, and it puts some ownership in when people are bringing out their waste, right? So it instantly beautifies your neighborhoods. We get rid of old containers. Everyone's gonna have a nice poly cart or two or three, whatever they decide, right? There's always going to be families of four or five, or however many that need more than one cart. That is completely, it's completely fine. You know, you can get up to two or three carts. I mean, <coughs> basically, whatever you feel like dragging out that you have the space for, you're more than welcome to get. <clears throat> but it just, creates a, it, it just creates a uniform look in the city and hopefully, not all, but hopefully people are going to, you know, like for me, my case, right, you, you bring it down the night before and, you know, when you come home from work. If you ever, if you're a Wednesday service day, you know, you're putting it out Tuesday night, your kiddo puts it out, whatever. Wednesday when you come home from work, the trash guy more than likely has already been there. And you wheel it back up and then you're done for the week, right? So it gets all these things off the street. Of course there's going to be folks that aren't going to do it. And that's between you and your ordinances and your code enforcement if you all want to. Some cities create ordinance for it, some cities don't. Some create it, don't do anything about it, some don't, everybody is different. But I'm just here to tell you about the service, right? How, how y'all produce the ordinance. I can guide you as to what other cities are doing and, and how Code E is working on it. Um, but it works in, um, it, it works in every community. Um, their automation is, well you already know because you're using it in some, but it is a much, much more efficient and better looking aesthetically way to uh, to pick up trash. Sure. What, what about our residents that are one way or the other physically challenged and can't I'm manage? Sure, perfect. A, I was gonna, I'm, I was gonna get to that. So yeah, so perfect, uh, perfect segue to it. So we understand that there's going to be some folks that cannot, you know, and we, we brought later on, I mean, everybody is welcomed if you don't have a cart, everybody is welcome to come out and push one of these things around. But um, we know they're not going to be uh, easy for everybody to do, we get it. Um, so we do offer a service for those that are going to qualify, right? And they'll qualify through the city and we'll set the guidelines with you and we'll show you kind of how we handle those guidelines. Um, but we do offer the service to where if there is somebody that cannot move that cart, um, the driver will take the time to go get the cart, service it, and put it back for them, right? Now, could we do that to the entire town? Absolutely not. It would take, us, it would take you three weeks to do trash, right? But if you talk about a very minimal portion of the population, that service exists. We do it in every one of our cities. So it's, uh, there's definitely help available. Now, the qualifications are something that we'd have to set, right? So if you have somebody who's unable to move a cart, but they've got two 16-year-old boys living in the home, then they're probably not going to qualify for it, right? But if it's, you know, we'll help you with those guidelines. I mean, it has to be somebody who truly needs the help. Um, but we absolutely offer the service, no doubt. Um, I'm going to skip over this because... Um, this was before I knew we were actually gonna see the truck, so uh, we're actually gonna show you, when you wanna step out later on, we're gonna show you uh, a lot of this stuff. <clears throat> um, 
let's see. So I was going to introduce some of the team, but at this time I didn't know exactly who was coming. So uh, Jay is actually here out of this group, and Jeff is actually here out of this group. <clears throat> so we, I want to speak a little bit about the bulk collection, because that's very important, because you saw the pictures, right? What we're proposing in, uh, and, you, and you have the binders that I sent. So you'll see in there that there's a monthly bulk collection. So what that monthly bulk collection is going to do is we are going to send a rear load truck and crew once a month in front of everyone's home. Now the bulk is where the poly cart is serviced. May not be on the same day, that all depends on routing, but your bulk pickup is going to be wherever your poly cart is serviced, right? So once a month, we're gonna go by every single home and we're going to pick up the bulk items. And we've got, um, you know, this is a three cubic yard limit, but three cubic yards is a lot. Um, and uh, so once a month, we will do that. Now we understand the first couple are probably going to be really heavy um, to get it cleaned up, right? And we understand that and we'll get some help from staff and I'm sure we can put something together to get a one time clean up to where we can start fresh. But we'll go by everybody's home one time a month It'll be on a set day. There will be no guessing. Everybody will know what day it's going to be. And typically, you know, the uh, couple days before, people can start cleaning up their yard or doing whatever they're doing and get their stuff outside. And our guys will come by, we'll, we'll pitch it, and we'll, we'll be in and out. You wouldn't even know we were there. And, and your, your neighborhoods will just stay very, very clean. And it'll be consistent. It is not going to be when we can or when we feel like it, right? So accountability is huge for us. Y'all hold us accountable. So if it's Friday, we're here on Friday, right? And so that's the beauty of privatization is y'all have complete control over solid waste, right? Because we answer to you. So if my phone starts ringing, these guys' phones are going to start ringing and we're going to get things done. That's just the way it goes, right? So we work for you. And, um, and, and I, think we do a I think we do a very good job on the bulk pickup. We do a great job on trash. But our bulk in our cities has been very, very successful. Very minimal complaints on how we handle bulk. Obviously, there's going to be some items, and, and we don't have to get deep into the weeds on you know, the do's and don'ts, but we'll help you with all of that. The implementation of the new plan, if we're lucky enough to get the opportunity to service you guys, look, we have an amazing communications team in Phoenix and we have our own printing press in Phoenix. We do everything for you. Postcards, letters, mail outs, flyers, town hall meetings, special council meetings. We've got everything in place to handle all of that stuff for you. And it's all included just from working with us. So it's not, hey, we're gonna charge you a thousand bucks to do this mail out. It, it's, it's part of it. So and we handle all of it. So you give us the addresses and what you want, you'll approve it all, we'll give you proofs. I mean, we can do small postcards, we can do large flyers, everything is in color, everything is beautiful. And we take care of all of that for you to make sure that when and if we do this, the, implement, the implementation is perfect and your customers have zero questions. We wanna answer them all and we want this to be a community effort. And we have zero problem coming out and doing if it's working with the chamber, it, it, it doesn't matter, right? We, we're willing to do whatever it takes to show the citizens this is a great service for you, right? Because we understand they're gonna pay a little bit more, but we want them to see what they're getting for it, right? They're gonna get, they're, gonna, they're, they're going to be getting a superior service. They're gonna be getting on-time service, right? <clears throat> Republic is, um, so yeah, I mean, obviously we brought one of these to, to show you, but uh, that was before I, I was uh, asked to bring them, so outside we'll show you a few of these trucks and the carts, obviously. But the commercial piece, let me talk a little bit, and I'll, and I'll be brief. Um, so to start, what, what Republic wants to do is we want to make a $2.7 million investment in your community in year one. And what you're going to get for that $2.7 million is you guys are going to be getting six brand new trucks specifically to work for your city. Every citizen is going to get brand new poly carts. One, two, three, however we feel like they need. Every commercial business is going to be getting a brand new front load of the size of their choice, whatever sizes they have, right? So the investment is big on our part, 
but we take our communities very seriously. We're not going to come in here and peace. <coughs> we don't come in and piecemeal our communities to, together, right? So y'all are going to have beautification in year one. Not day one, because it takes time to get all these things right. Trucks right now are taking six to eight months. So we'll have some rental trucks that are going to service the city for the first few months, because it takes a little while to get the trucks in. Um, but you'll start seeing the containers arriving, you know, fairly quickly, you know, six to eight weeks, containers will start arriving. But it should be fairly seamless, right? And we will guide you through, if we're lucky enough with the opportunity, we'll guide you through everything. These guys are experts at what they do. And it, we will try to make it as seamless as possible, right? Um, but we do want to make a substantial investment in your community. Um, one thing I didn't um, put on here is, uh, yeah, the rest is trucks and whatnot. So one thing I didn't put on here is um, uh, the, <clears throat> the agreement that you all have uh, with the county, right? So um, I was, I was semi-brought up to speed on, on the uh, convention center and, and, and things like that. So originally we were going to, um, as, a, as a community partner, we were, we were going to take care of the Rattlesnake Roundup and things like that, right? We're still going to do that. Um, we're going to honor the agreement um, that you have with the county. And uh, we don't have to get into the nuts and bolts of that at this moment. But we know that the agreement exists, and we will, do, we will never put you in a bind. So we're going to honor that agreement that you have with the county. So just know that in case it's on your mind, uh, we, we're, we're going to honor that agreement for you, right? And um, <clears throat> we also have, uh, you know, our community involvement is, is huge, especially for, uh, for Sweetwater. You know, we are deeply involved in our chambers. We're deeply involved in our communities. We've got funds available to help with with um, any community events that you do. Um, I have uh, some earmarked funds that are going to be used for anything that people use, anything that, that we have going on. Dave and I were joking about parades and things like that earlier this morning. I mean, those are the things that we do. And so um, I just wanted to give you a little history about the company and go over the service a little bit. Dana did a great job, right? But just know that the things that you see um, about the current service are, are not abnormal at all, right? So the solid waste departments in every city do what they can do with the funds that are available. It is certainly not a, uh, uh, it, it is a revenue generator to some extent, but typically in cities, that's not a huge revenue generator. Most cities are lucky to break even. Most cities are losing money. And so it's very hard to have brand new containers sitting in your streets and things like that. So what you're seeing is not abnormal, but. Those are the things that we like to come in and help you with, right? So with that, if you all have any questions, I, I would love to uh, answer them for you. On your uh, monthly curbside bulk collection, sure. you've got some parameters there that uh, things can't weigh more than 50 pounds. And be, any one object. In, okay. Yeah. So mattresses and couches and that kind of, because there's a, there's a four foot limit in there too. So right. So let me not pick those up. Yeah. So let me explain the four foot limit, right? So that, the four foot limit is, uh, the four foot bundle is tree branches, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're not driving down the, the, we're not driving down the road with a tree shredder, right? So these, these guys are, are pitching it in the back of a real low garbage truck, right? So we ask that they be bundled because A, they have to fit, right? So they can't take an 18 foot limb and put, it's just not gonna work. This is a trash compactor on wheels, right? So it has to be able to fit in the truck. And the reason why it has to be bundled is because when we, when we pull up to a home to do a bulk pickup, we don't have 20 minutes per home to sit there and pick up 50 tree branches, right? The object is the service is not there to provide free tree trimming right. removal, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you trim your trees and you've got all this. It, we're not designed to kind of be the, you know, the, the, the arborists that come out and, sure. and get rid of all this stuff, right? There's gotta be some responsibility that if you're gonna trim your trees, you, you've gotta have a means to get rid of it. It's the smaller items that you can cut and tie a piece of rope on it to where we can pick it up and move, right? That's what it's designed for. It's, um, and, and look, that's gonna be an anomaly anyway, but if you have 10 bags of leaves, that's perfectly fine, but we're not going to shovel a pile of leaves into the back of the truck, okay. right? But what, what about old furniture and you hit Yes. You had mentioned refrigerators and Correct. freezers. So the, well, so refrigerators get tricky because you're dealing with Freon. So we will take a refrigerator or a freezer, but it has to be tagged that it's been, uh, that the Freon has been taken out of it, and it has to be by a licensed professional. Okay. 
a lot of people don't go through the expense of having somebody do that. But unfortunately, you know, we, I mean, not unfortunately, TCEQ is not unfortunate, but we have, a, <laughs> we have guidelines. No, 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 no. Of, yeah, I know. Well, I get, yeah, look, yeah, well, I'm on YouTube right now, I'm sure, so I'm going to be very careful. <laughs> no, but so you, you guys understand there's, there's, there's regulations, right? Some we love, some we don't, but we have to abide by them. So we, we won't pick up just a random refrigerator and chunk it in the back, or shouldn't we? It's got to be tagged. Washing machines, dryers, furniture, couches, mattresses, the stuff that you and I would normally have, yes. Absolutely. We'll take it. Um, in some of the literature you sent us, you said on average you uh, maintain a 15 to 1 ratio of routes to supervisors. Correct. Um, would you consider Sweetwater is going to be one route, or would there be multiple routes within the city? Gentlemen, Jay? Um, Sorry to put you on the spot. Oh, that's, that's okay. Jay, could you speak to the microphone? We are recording. Yeah, I don't know how many, uh, I don't know how the rest of um, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm fairly new here, so we haven't looked at the routes totally, but it's going to be between five and seven routes. Um, we're currently below our threshold for route supervisors. We would not be adding a supervisor. It would be shared between Joel and Adam, who's on vacation today. Um, so Joel primarily runs commercial, so those commercial routes would fall under him, and the residential would fall under Adam. Okay. Would it be done, the pickup be done like in one day, the whole city, or no. it's going to stagger? No, sir. It would it would it would be different areas on different days for residential, and I, and I haven't looked at the commercial mapping yet, so I'd have to take a, a harder look at that to see what it would look like. Okay. And so you just answered my question, next question, but you haven't developed the routes for Sweetwater yet. Uh, no, sir, we have not. But okay. I'd love the opportunity. And I know to get we're to very it. early in the process. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, put you on the spot. <laughs> and how do you pick up the like a uh, let's say a couch? Do y'all have some kind of loader or? You just have physical manpower. Physical manpower right over there, Mr. Ke Mr. Kevin Burks. Um, usually two on the truck. Yeah, my, my understanding with the current proposal would be it would be concurrent with the um, cart pickup, and it would just be a specific week we would do certain areas. Okay. So week week one, we might pick up the Monday route, and week two, we might pick up the Tuesday route. Yeah. We, have, we haven't finalized all that, but that's usually how it works. And your phone number is on the rollout card? It is not. It would be on all of our literature that, that Joe and I and the team would, would send out. Um, but, but no, it would be on the, the front load containers. It would be on the front load containers. Okay. <clears throat> and you've got your three call centers uh, that have fairly long hours, but if is a specific call center going to be assigned to Sweetwater, or if it's really late in the day and that call center is closed, we're the guy routed to the one in, I think, Arizona or wherever? Exactly. It's on a rolling schedule, so towards the end of the day, it rolls back to the West Coast, but they're located in Phoenix, Indianapolis, and Charlotte currently. Okay, so that's 15 hours a day plus five hours on, it's almost 80 hours a week, which all are accessible as opposed to what City Hall is accessible. But I some, some yeah. Joe and I will be accessible 24 hours yeah, a day as well. <laughs> Dana and I were emailing, I think, at 5.15 uh, five, five this morning. We're very available. <laughs> Um, the trucks that will service Sweetwater will roll from an Abilene facility? That is correct, sir. Are there plans for to maybe localize something here? Would there be any consideration for that? I can speak to that. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so great <laughs> question. So when we, when, we look at, um, when we look at the way we operate our market, Right? We are always looking for ways that we can streamline the service. So there have been many conversations, especially of late, when we talk about this opportunity possibly coming to fruition. When we look at the I-20 corridor, right? we have a lot of business on I-20, but when we look at what we do between here and let's say our next division in Midland, there's a lot of opportunity between 
So when you start running those routes out of Abilene, some of them can create, you know, 70 and 80 mile one-way trips, right? Um, and sometimes even longer, depending on, uh, you know, how far east and west you go and how far north and south you go. I mean, it, we all know how large this part of the country is. And so there are some talks that um, expanding our division is, is definitely going to be something that we're thinking heavily. Um, and so I'm the one that originally said, look, we have a great opportunity possibly coming down the pipeline to have a great city where we could find a, uh, a substantial opportunity to have, you know, a, a full division here, or at least a satellite um, to where we could have trucks parked. We don't park a truck outside of our yard, right? Because they do pre and post trips, maintenance has to be on site. So there's a lot of things that go on, right? We're a very safe company. And the reason why we're so reliable is because Jeff makes sure that everything is looked at every single day, right? Um, and that's not taking into account the trucks that we have, the service trucks we have that are going to the truck, right, in the, on the road. So it is definitely appetizing, right? So I'm not in our real estate division, so I can't say, yes, it's going to happen in the next year. But it is something that we have teed up and we have had several conversations about, yes, because this is very appetizing because of where it where Sweetwater sits and the uh, applicant pool that we would have for technicians and things of that nature, <coughs> drivers especially. So it's it's definitely something that has been talked about. I can tell you that. The refuse is that are y'all will y'all be using our landfill or do you're going to use y'all's landfill? We will not. So we own the Abilene landfill, right? And uh, so typically we like to what's called internalize all our garbage, right? So we pick it up and we bring it to our own landfill. And so that does one of two things, right? It, um, it allows us to, uh, to give competitive rates, right? So if you start using outside landfills, obviously you're paying a retail versus wholesale price if you think about it in terms of, you know, of being a consumer. Mm -hmm. So we, we typically like to uh, utilize our own landfill. Plus, you have a Type 4, so we wouldn't be able to do anything but CND anyway, so. David, how does this impact our contract with Snyder? We've had conversations with, we did. with uh, Republic specifically about this. The contract expires uh, sometime in 2020. Do you remember the month, Dana? There's a six-month uh, lead time that we need to give them. What we've proposed and, and talked to Republic, and, and I believe they have agree and still agree to do it, is uh, pay off the rest of that uh, obligation that we would have to Snyder until the end right. of, the, of that term. So you have what's called a put or pay, right? So um, we offer two solutions. One, we can just honor the agreement and we can just bring them the minimal tonnage that your contract states. Um, it seems to me the easiest part would be for us to just buy that contract for you mm -hmm. and we're certainly willing to do that. So, correct. Yeah, so look, and we, and to, be, to give you a completely honest answer, we have not begun the process of routing like these guys said, right? So, depending on how today goes, right, this could start very, very quickly. And if we get the go ahead, then we're going to start that process of having our guys drive the neighborhoods, look at the alleys, and we want to start getting how are we going to service this particular area. So, there may be some alleys depending on the size and if they have a good improved surface and if it's something that we feel like is safe something that's accessible and if they have a driveway for the cart but there will be no cart in an alley that does not have a driveway correct yeah you're exactly right so that's one of the other reasons to get out of the alley because if you are not putting garbage in the alley by nature then hopefully people will just quit going back there, right? The only thing you can use it for is what they were originally used for. So the utilities and things of that nature. So hopefully people will just realize that if I put it back here, it's never going to disappear, right? And so hopefully that would deter them from actually putting it in there. Absolutely. So you already have that in place, so you're already ahead of the game. So when you look at a residential rate, you, you're talking about like a poly cart at home? Yeah, so if one cart is not enough, there is a, uh, there's a discounted rate. Um, I can't speak to that rate because I don't know what y'all charge at the curb. 
Um, but there, you can get as many cards as you want. It wouldn't be as expensive as your initial card, to answer your question. I just couldn't tell you what that rate would be. But it would be cheaper than your first card. So let's say you're, we know, you're, we know the first card right now, I think it's when you consider the bulk, right? Well, an all-in rate, you know, we, I don't want to confuse the residential rate with the residential rate and the bulk. So unfortunately, when you look in that proposal thing, it's got two separate line items, bulk and rent. That's just the way our, that's just the way our Excel sheet was spitting it out. I like the all in because the bulk is the service, right? So it's, it's not a Mr. Smith wants it, Mrs. Johnson next door doesn't, this guy wants, everyone's gonna either get it or not get it, and that's your decision, right? So we should have done an all in rate, it's just the Excel sheet wouldn't let it come out like that. So, you know, you're looking at, let's call it just for easy math, because I'm not looking at it, right? 27, let's say it's $27 at the curb, which is what's on your bill. So your, your second cart, you know, could be 15 bucks. It wouldn't be 27 again, it'd be a discounted rate. Again, that's something that the council and, and staff will set. I have another question. Um, for sure. example, an elderly person, uh, he's able to take his trash or the bin out to the street. He falls, breaks his leg, or, or for some reason, he's not able to do it. Who does he call, or who? how would he go about saying, I'm not going to be able to take right. my, my dumpster so, to the street. Perfect. What, what do I need to do? Who do they call? Right. Or? So the residential service is provided by us, but it's your customer, right, because you're billing it. Mm -hmm. So that customer would have to call the water, just like they would today. Okay. That customer would call the water office and go, you know, I have – an extenuating circumstance, I slipped on the ice, God forbid, whatever it is, yeah. doesn't matter. They would then say, okay, Mr. Smith, they would go down the checklist that we all agreed upon. Do you have anybody of age that's living at home? Well, no, my son doesn't live here. Well, yeah, I have an 18-year-old daughter that lives here. Well, he's got somebody. If he lives alone, the answer is yes, okay. right? We can what if it all day long because there's so many different, you know, there's so many different things that can come along. But the answer is that service is absolutely there. Sure. Okay. And it will be done through you. Is there an additional charge for There's that not. service? There's not. There are no additional fees. What y'all have in that proposal that was delivered <laughs> is the rate for everything. So there are there are there are there is nothing that is hidden. I mean, on the even on the commercial side, the only the only fees that are on commercial is of course after the initial set of the town. You know, eight months from now, somebody opens up a tire shop and needs a two yard. There's a delivery fee, right? And then if, if you know, you have, if we have a, a stripes or a town or whatever they are now, right? If they have two eight yards and they're what's called snow coning, right? They have too much trash piled. That's an overage fee. So they're not hidden fees because they're there, but that's to the customer anyway. But from the city standpoint, there is nothing extra that y'all would have to worry about. Nothing. In the cart delivery fee that you've got listed of $22.22, .22, okay. we're not going to, our residents aren't going to pay that as we transition to this. Moment. Absolutely not. Okay. The initial now set. If somebody moves in two years from now, correct. then they have to pay it? Absolutely. Okay. There is no charge for the initial setup. Any other questions? Yes, sir. question we get that a lot so did you hear that question he's saying if I if I forget to bring my car out <laughs> so look that <laughs> he's already laughing so look that goes back to what I said while ago right we have to it's ownership right so we're gonna have to get people look we understand the first few weeks hopefully just weeks but <laughs> we understand there's gonna be a learning curve right we get it we do it every day there's a learning curve and we'll help you through it but if this fine gentleman, which I don't think he's going to do it. I think he's a smart guy. I, th I think he's a smart guy. I don't think he's going to do it. But if he does, and he, and, and, and look, these guys are going to kill me. I don't know if we haven't left the town yet. It could be a possibility, right? It's not the norm, especially if we're gone. But if he calls us the next day and he said, hey, man, I forgot to put my card out yesterday. Typically, that's not the way it goes. Usually, it's, hey, y'all skipped me yesterday. Mm. Nobody's going to say it. <laughs> yeah. so he, he's going to call and go, hey, man, I had it out last night, and y'all just drove right by my house. 
that's usually the way it goes, but no. If we're in town, it is a possibility that a dispatcher could probably get somebody. It's not the norm. If it's possible, look, we're going to do the best we can to service the customer, but I'm never going to promise that if you miss that truck, we're going to be able to pull a U-turn and come back to get you because there's 800 other homes on that route that are waiting for us to get there and waiting for us to get off your streets and get out of here, right? So typically, you would have to wait. <clears throat> but you're not going to do that. I know he's not going to do that. Go ahead. Um, on that, we ask that you be honest that you forgot because we do get rated <laughs> yeah, on our, our miss pickup performance. Um, yeah. but, but right now we're performing at about four misses perceived misses per 10,000 services in Abilene. Um, but we have a 24 hour requirement regardless. If you call in and say you, you miss me, we have to pick it up by the following day at the end of the day, unless it's on a Friday. Okay. Can you. Uh, talk a little bit more in depth about the education process sure. that, that you'll help with. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, every city does it different, right? So some cities really like to do town hall meetings, and some cities try to stay away from them because you just never know what, uh, what they turn into, right? So <laughs> we can do, we can do um, like I, I talked about the mail outs, right, which we will build for you, and you all would, you know, staff obviously would approve and say, yeah, I think this one looks great. We'll do as many as it takes. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the flyers, but to me, I think if you did a few postcards or flyers and things like that in the mail, especially, I don't know, um, I'm not a Facebook guy, but I, w I don't know if y'all have a city Facebook page, mm -hmm. if you had that, that would certainly help social media, obviously, just like anything, social media seems to be the way everybody's doing anything. And the good thing about social media, if there is a good thing about it is, um, sometimes problems get solved on social media faster than we all can solve them because somebody else chimes in and goes, well, yeah, you missed it because you put it out on the wrong day or, you know, I have this much bulk out there, the guys didn't pick it up, and then somebody goes, oh, well, you're not supposed to put a propane tank out, you know. So sometimes that's good. I think social media, we, we would need a strong social media presence. Um, but look, you know, Mr. Cherry, to, to just answer it, we're going to do whatever y'all feel like we need to do. Only you know what your what your citizens are going to need as far as, you know, how much information do they need? And I mean, we're just here to help you through however you see fit. I do think one town hall meeting probably wouldn't hurt, um, but that's completely up to, uh, to you folks. But it could be as big as you want it to be. I mean, I've had some do it at, I've had some do big ones at convention centers and I've had, you know, people just do an open session at council. I mean, we'll, we'll do whatever you feel like we need to do. And, and um, if we, if people are not familiar with poly carts and things of that nature, obviously I'll, we'll bring a couple out and let them, you know, let them drag it around and kind of see what's going on. Once you have a signed contract in hand, how how soon does the transition occur? So we, so we work for you, right? So it, we would sit down and and uh, and discuss when you feel like um, a, a a proper start date would be. Um, we would need a little bit of lead time, you know, to, uh, to start. So it could go two ways, right? Um, if y'all were in, so we do go into some cities that are in um, dire straits. I don't feel like y'all are there, but some are. Some are like, man, we could really use some help. We, we have help available, right? If, if trash is not getting in the air, we will help you get trash in the air, and that could be as quickly as it needed. Even if it's servicing your own containers that you have, we can make that happen for you. We've already had these discussions. Um, the other portion is, look, we can just do a hard start date where we say, look, we're gonna rip the Band-Aid off on, you know, it could be, we'll call it February 1st, or whatever you wanted to do. This is the go date. That'll give us time to find a yard to where we can drop, get our containers delivered, right? And, um, and start getting them, you know, to coordinate with y'all, hopefully within the same time frame. You know, we drop ours, you pick yours, and, and we start going. Um, Jeff's got, uh, we do, I told you we're gonna be buying all brand new <coughs> trucks if given the opportunity, but we do have rental trucks on standby. So we're ready to have wheels rolling. Um, we would just have to get containers. So I mean, it could, be, it could be very, very quickly that we start at least one service, right? If you wanted us to do the commercial and then roll it out, or we just do a hard start date and rip the Band-Aid off and go. It's whatever y'all want. But that hard start date would be something that, you know, Dana and I and David and Whoever else wants to be involved will figure it out, but uh, we, we, we're willing to work at your pace. I have a question for Russell. With regard to the old 
dumpsters, where would they be put once they're removed from the alley? So we've got some uh, we've got some services available. We've got some folks available that um, can come in and, and help you um, look at your uh, look at your fleet and put you in touch with um, brokers and wholesalers that uh, uh, that can find places for them. Right? We do it all the time. So it's it's a service that we've got, and people can come and help you with that. As far as the containers go, we've got a lot of partnerships with. Um, uh, metal recyclers, obviously. So, I mean, we can we can certainly turn you on to a couple that we currently use that would be more than happy to pay you a fair market value for the uh, for the steel for the metal. So I'll tell you, um, you know, last year, well, look, so all over the state, we all know about Harvey, right? So, I mean, and we had a, a very, very large presence uh, on the coast. But I can tell you that um, we've got, and that's one of the beauties of, of dealing with a, with a large company with a national presence, is we have, a, uh, we have a, a program that is available, our SOS program, right? And so not only is it for driver shortages and upticks in business, things of that nature, but it's, it, it exists for cities when we need help, right? And you, we deploy assets very, very quickly. Um, Jay has worked on some of those. Jeff has worked on some SOS stuff. And not only do we use it for maintenance, but we use it for what you're exactly talking about. We partner with our cities. We would be partnering with you folks, your emergency management folks. That's all part of it. We just didn't get into the nuts and bolts of it here. But typically, we will be sitting down with your emergency management folks and your county folks as your provider and working out a plan to put together what do we do with storm debris, who picks it up, how does it work. We do it in all the cities. I do it personally so I can guide you through exactly how we do it. It's a very successful program, and um, it, is, uh, it is something that I say is probably one of the most important items that we offer is the fact that you have the muscle available to pull this town through natural disasters. We hope it never happens. You know, we had a mini, we had a mini tornado in San Angelo last year, and it, it, you know, it damaged 200 homes. And uh, you know we deployed that we deployed that uh, there, and I will, I will say that we have a really great program that we set up in San Angelo that works flawlessly, and we would do something similar here. I do it in some other cities, but um, it's a great program on that's very very organized. The citizens know about it and things like that. So um, it's one of the benefits of working with a larger company is the assets that we can deploy are are, are pretty remarkable. <coughs> Any other questions? Thanks, sir. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. We're going to take a 10-minute recess and go outside and look at the trucks right quick. Could, could I ask one quick question, Adana? We've got expenditures. We're going to we're we're going to either lose money because of loss of revenue from refuse collection, or we're going to have to spend money to upgrade. Our existing fleet, <coughs> and did I understand you correctly that that's basically a wash? Well, I wouldn't. I mean, I, it's hard to say it's a wash. I just can say that either way, there's going to be an investment made, and the way I look at it, without having the real specific numbers and with the maintenance costs and with the new vehicles that we would have to put in, I think that uh, you would put a pretty significant amount into that system that I'm not sure that we can manage over five years even just with the payments. Thank you. Dana, would the, would the resale of our old vehicles and the scrapping of the old uh, dumpsters possibly be enough to pay for a year service with this company if we went with them? I mean, how much are we, 
two hundred thousand dollars, maybe. Uh, and that's, that's probably not enough. Yeah, but. we all. That, I don't know. We have have a number for that, Russell, but uh, we haven't really put a pencil to that. That seems to be fairly high for scrapping our containers. Uh, a lot of our containers are just not even scrappable. I mean, they're just in bad shape. Some newer ones that we might have purchased in the last two or three years have more value, but I'm not sure what it would bring. I'm not sure it's going to bring enough, quite honestly. Now with the vehicles, uh, you know, if we have some help, uh, we might be able to get something back from some of the, you know, the commercial trucks or residential trucks that we would no longer need. That that could bring in significantly more potentially than the containers for sure. Jim, were you thinking about a one-year trial mm -hmm. contract? Well, well no, I just I'm trying to see if if that first year may be a wash. Okay. If with the sale of vehicles, but it may not be. It may not be enough okay. revenue generation. be talking about the garbage collection trucks only at this point in time. We do have other vehicles and trucks that we use for our solid waste, our landfill and our recycling operations that we would keep in our inventory. Um, so that is something that we currently have and we're paying off on a few of those right now. But uh, we're just talking about the garbage collection trucks mm -hmm. only. We're still going to provide uh, the truck overnight, weekend, for loading debris like has been done, I, I don't know for how many years. We're still going to do that, Russell? I think at this point we may have moved on to item 5C without opening item 5C. <laughs> the last yeah. thing the mayor said was, let's take a recess and, and go outside. So we're happy to come back to 5C and have the general discussion. I hope that's okay. Recess.